back as we fill your mind with spooky true crime stories of the deranged, unhinged, and absolute pure evil murders that will blow your mind. Some places you will visit to show you around and educate you on the history. Other times we will bring you to the paranormal because the dead never lie silent for too long. It'll be the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has a boy in the fucking field. Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Man. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Survived my first week of summer school. I'm doing good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no. You, I, that's right. It's summer school right now. Yeah. Oh, but you barely survived. Yeah, I barely survived. But I did, they had, though. They like, had you working. Today's my Friday. It's really Thursday. I get three-day weekends during the... Uh, during summer, so I get Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. Oh, and that's let me nice. tell you, that third day makes such a difference. Like, it really, the people, like, I always thought, like, why do people work, like, four tens? Like, why do they, yeah. why do they do that? I know why they do it. Every yeah. summer, I'm reminded why people do that. Um, we get the option at our job in the summer to work four tens. I would. Um, the only reason, I would I would love to too. The only reason why I don't is because I have to take some time off in the summer. And it messes with your time somehow. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know exactly how it does, but so it just makes your time messed up. Oh, okay. And so it's just easier just to work a regular work week. Because when you take a... Like, let's say I took a Tuesday off. Well, technically, it's 10 hours, not eight hours. So oh, it's not a day. You're right. You're right. You're right. So, yeah. So it kind of messes with our. Um, you're right. I didn't when think I go that. to my in, my non contract days on, yeah. like, on counting, it messes me up. So I just. Oh, the okay. first year we were so messed up that I just. I never again. So. Makes sense. Yeah. So today's my Friday. I get three days off. I'm excited. I'm excited for you. Oh, my yeah. goodness. I keep kicking something down here <laughs> oh it's just the, it's okay it's the suitcase yeah if you guys could only see what this place looks like it's it's what is looks it called ri jimmy rigged yeah it looks really uh put together on camera but <laughs> so we're hoping to get a we're hoping to have like a little remodel yeah. here soon we have wires just everywhere uh, literally everywhere I know. and my crazy. dog always comes in and wants to walk through the mall so <laughs> yes no. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have any interesting, fun news? Anything? I don't yet. I mean, we maybe we might. Oh, I do. I'm going to Germany oh, yeah. in England with my mom and my dad. So I'm really super excited about that at the end of August. Yeah, that so, sounds so fun. I know. Well, my dad's doing a He-Man convention. I would come with you because, you know, I thought that I was German and then I did my <laughs> DNA and found out that I'm not. So. Oh, yeah. But maybe you are. Because my German didn't show up right away either. Mine shows up like, and I know I, thought, I am because I'm I a Burkhardt. Like I, I thought my mom, my mom's last name is Morshbacker. Like, for the love of the Lord. Like, yeah. come on. I grew up my whole life telling people that I'm Sicilian and German. You're just Sicilian? Yeah. No, oh. no German. My mom's side is like uh, Scottish and Irish. Oh. Did, you know what? Because I grew up. With the German, because my last name too, Burkhardt and everything. But uh, it has something to do with, they were, I, I don't know, I got to look into it. I'm going to say something wrong. Yeah, but I, I think they were like kind of time, because I know that it changes, like it does whatever. Change. But no, it's like zero. Like but nothing. mine all came up from like the Welsh area, like Welsh mm -hmm. and all that. But I think they, they moved down into Germany. So, oh. but I don't know. I mean, I might not be as German as I thought I was too, but. Yeah, I have none. I'm, no, no, no. I'm, I take that back. When I first, I had none, but now I have it. It showed oh. up. It eventually did show up on mine. Oh, so. okay. Well, I'll hmm. have to check. But yeah. so anyway, even though I'm not German, I'm still excited for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm so excited because, you know, my dad does the signings for He-Man. Yeah. So they asked him to come and they're paying for him. And that's awesome. You know, since they're up there in age, they asked me to go with them. So I said, yes. Yeah. So I'm excited. That's no. very cool. We yeah. might be traveling soon too. Yes. I hope so. Cross yeah. our fingers if the days work out. Yeah. So we're figuring out days right now. Yeah. Do we want to say where we're going or no? 
Oh, well, we'll keep it in the belt because just in case it changed, like just in okay. case we decide like, oh, you know what? Okay. Let's, okay. Because okay, we'll, decide like we'll something keep, else, maybe whatever. We'll keep it under wraps. Because of the price or whatever. But it's really cool. We'll see. Yeah. I think I'm excited. that's the cool one. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh-huh. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm always excited. So I'm, uh, yeah. So I'm my, surprised she's excited because you're going on a plane. Well, I, okay. So uh, this is why I'm really pushing this trip because, you know, all the other times, multiple times we've traveled, that has been in a car. Yeah. But you won't get in a plane. No. Well, before. Though. But we're going to Mexico next October, October 2025. And you have to For get my daughter's plane. wedding. I have to get on a plane. My daughter's getting married. So yeah. I want to, you know, fit in as many trips on a plane as i can before then so hopefully by then i'm like oh cool well we should probably do a quick jaunt too to like you know scottsdale or something phoenix yeah, like I a mean, little 50 minute trip but, and back or i mean something. i was thinking we could even fly to vegas to go see frankie perez and fly home oh there you go because he see? just had he just uh he's doing a residency at the red rock so the only reason why i dread doing flights to vegas it's in one the turbulence is bad i heard well only because it goes over the mountains so yeah. you know why but that's not even the worst part the worst part is you spend more time in the airport mm. getting in and out because of la um yeah. getting in and out that it it's same amount of time as if i were just to get to in drive. my car and drive over there and then now i'm in vegas and i don't even have a vehicle yeah <laughs> so yeah, yeah that's true i don't know that's the only reason but true true so yeah so maybe we'll have to throw in like you know just a couple three three day little, little jaunts somewhere close yeah okay san francisco maybe or something sounds good you know? yeah so um so today i don't even know how i found this story to be honest with you because i had never heard of it i had it, never heard of and it, it took place here in california um it takes place out in valencia which is not like a real well-known place i think most people know it for being the home of magic mountain that's what Um, i was gonna say magic mountain yeah which in my younger days i really really loved the place but now as an adult um it's probably my biggest nightmare that was my that was my younger self because now you will not get me on any of those rides no so um yeah but uh so i'm which is i mean it's not around the corner from us but it's not 45 minutes yeah it's not super super far yeah so i'm i'm kind of um surprised that i never heard of this because um it's a really really interesting case i think we were busy having kids in 1991 yeah because that's when my son was born yeah yeah but you know back then i think people watched the news a lot more than they well i don't know i didn't i don't watch the news (laughs) now (laughs) I watched the news more back then than I do now. Now I'm, uh, no, you, I'm, I'm, I don't like it. I don't watch it. I don't have it on my phone. I don't. But yet she looks up true crime all day long. Oh yeah. In discovery and, you oh, know, yeah. <laughs> watches all those shows. Of course. It, God, God forbid anybody checked my search history. I was saying that the other day. Oh Lord. I was like at my work, like how to get rid of a body. Like, you know, like. If anything, I mean, God yeah. forbid, happened to any of my family members, they think I did it just yep. based. If they were just to say, you know what, let's, let's get just your check laptop her search history Thank you. real quick. How do you get rid of a body? Yeah. How does somebody decapitate but, I mean, another hello? person? We like, have a true crime podcast. Yeah. So, um, and that's and I look up some of that stuff and just because I'm like, oh, does it happen? Like, how did mm-hmm. people learn? Like, you know, and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't be googling this. Um. So I want to share something. <laughs> I want to share something uh, that happened yesterday so i had a dentist appointment and oh mr dr wong dr wong was that the one you sent me to i liked him oh i love him so yeah. much the usc doctor yes yeah yes he's amazing and so um so i had an appointment and then i found out the day before my appointment i get an email and i'm assuming that it's just to confirm my appointment and it says dr wong is retiring after 44 years i'm so sad i'm so so sad but anyway he's retiring so, um, so I was like, okay, when, so today is his last day. So I got one of his last appointments. Oh, and so, um, I go to work yesterday. That's, it's so sad that I'm, I'm sad you're saying that because I've been having difficulty right here. Uh-huh. And I thought to myself, maybe I need to go see Jean, how, get the name well, of her doctor. There's, um, a new guy that's coming in. I met him yesterday. Okay. And and I told Dr. Wong, I said, look, if you refer him, if, if you're 
if he's taking over your practice, I trust anything. He said that it took him at least four or five years to find this guy. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's very, well, if you've seen Dr. Wong, yeah. you know, he's very particular. So yeah. I feel comfortable. Anyway, I'm driving to the dentist and I look down for some reason at my shirt and I realize that I'm wearing a little Wayne shirt. His name is Wayne. Wayne Wong. Wong. <laughs> so then I'm like, oh, come on. Now, mind you, Dr. Wong is like mm, 4'11". So he's little. He's, he's, a, little he's a real little Wayne. <laughs> so I walk in and I was like, I have to show you something really funny. And he's like, what? And I said, look at my shirt. <laughs> he started laughing so hard. So I was like, um, after my checkup, can... Um, can we take a picture together? <laughs> I want to take a picture, picture with little Wayne. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So he's like, I'm the real OG little Lil Wayne. Wayne. <laughs> he's little Wayne Wong. Yeah. Little Wayne Wong. <laughs> I'm sad. But anyway, my kids go to the same dentist, obviously. And so they've been pimping out our podcast there. Oh, good. And so I walked in the secretary was like, oh my God. She was telling one of the nurses, she's like, did you know Gina and her friend do a podcast? And it's called 50 States of Madness. Like she knew everything. I was like, okay, girl. <laughs> All right, kids. Dude, all right. I'm like, you oh must my. have saw my name in the books. <laughs> <laughs> she was all ready for you. Yeah. Yeah. So Our anyway. little celebrity moments. Right. Right. At the dentist. I would have known. <laughs> um, so anyway, today we're going to talk about a woman by the name of Anne. I believe you say it. Minkio Race. Uh, Race is her married name. It's R-A-C-Z. And I'm. Like ninety nine point nine 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 percent that it's pronounced race. Like you're gonna it, that makes sense. You're gonna race. Yeah. Um, and so she um is beautiful. She's an uh, she's Japanese and I don't know what. I read it, but I can't I can't remember. But she is like a very very striking woman. Like she's very beautiful. So, um. Basically, her and her husband had been married for a while. Um, I want to say something like 18 or 19 years. They had been married for a while. Three kids. Um, she was 42 years old in 1991 when she went missing, when she disappeared. Wow. And she went missing just days after, four days after filing for divorce and moving out of her house um, in Valencia. Her husband's name was John. And he was a retired Los Angeles County Sheriff, and he started teaching at a school in Compton. Oh, wow. That's just right here. Yeah. Compton oh. is very close to us, but yeah. so that's quite a drive. And Los Angeles like County Valencia, Sheriff. They Valencia. Know how to, to, they know how to get rid of somebody. <clears throat> right? <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, it's, re it's really interesting. And I couldn't, I couldn't find why he retired. Um, I think when I was listening to some podcasts on it too, as well, I think the reason why he retired was to spend because they were going going to go through the divorce. Uh -huh. A lot of officers sometimes it's hard because they're away from their they're away for their job a lot of the time. Yeah, but I think and he they was work a lot of hours before that. Did he? Oh, okay. He was a retired well, I thought, sheriff before. I thought they were having problems. So they I were. thought, yeah. So yeah. I thought maybe he was setting up because they were saying how you work mm. a lot of hours. So he was trying to be more at home. At home, yeah. Yeah. And so that, and also so that it wouldn't be held against him if mm. he was going to try to get custody of the kids. Oh, it would show that, that he's. Sense. That makes sense. He is at home with them as well. Right. So that's what yeah. some of the speculation was, like some of the guessing as to why he retired. But also, LA caught like you start at 20 you can retire by 40 with your full pension oh yeah right? so oh, yeah so if he started really young he a lot of them retire in their 40s early 50s that's true it, because so he might have just been at that age where he where was ready he was to retire done. yeah you're yeah. ready to retire you, you know you already got you're getting your full pension at that point yeah that makes sense. so yeah no that that I didn't even think of so yeah um so they were married um, and on the outside look too appeared to be like a very happy couple. Doesn't it always? It always. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anne, uh, Anne was, I believe, a stay at home mom. Uh, and she did some volunteer work at the at the church, at the kids schools and stuff like that. 
Um, and so at her church, she had told some of her friends um, that she had planned to leave John. And I believe that this was about a year prior to her actually leaving him, that she had been telling them that they were having problems. She said that he was tight with money. Um, and I feel, I don't know if it came from her maybe not working or if she did, she didn't have like a big income. He was kind of like yeah, the like breadwinner. Curious like how she would be able to go off on her own if she was a stay at home mom and so dependent yeah. on his income. But I guess, you know, you're counting on the divorce to help you out with that, I guess with spousal right. support. And, and you have, they have three kids, so yeah. she'll get, you know, child support, the whole thing. So she left him a note. Um, when he was in the shower and then she left, she left him a dear John letter. Wow. Yeah. She didn't even tell him face to face. Yeah. So she had signed a lease on a condo for six months and did all of this without him knowing. I'm sure she was probably pocketing some money, putting stuff away. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm and sure. maybe that's why he was so tight with money. Cause you know, he's kind of like, wait, what's going on here? What's happening? Like, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. So Anne asked her friend if she could park her car at her house so John wouldn't know where she was living. After Anne and John talked, she told her friend maybe she had worried for nothing. He wasn't as upset as she thought he would be, and he only yelled a few times. (laughs) Only. (laughs) Only a few times. (laughs) Um, She spent her time with the kids at the beach the following day and even agreed to go to counseling with John at church. He begged and begged her to please come back home. However, Anne was very adamant about leaving. She didn't want to keep John from seeing the kids. She just wanted a divorce. And sometimes I feel like, like when I went through my divorce, like that's exactly how I felt. I don't care. I don't want your money. I don't want, um, I just don't want to be your wife anymore. Yeah, that's it. Just simple. Take you, whatever yeah. you need to take. I'm not here to take your money, your your belongings, your nothing. Like, I just don't want to be your wife anymore. Yeah, That's simple. It. That's it. Just yeah. give me a divorce and let's be done. So on April 22nd, 1991, only four days after Anne had moved out, she went to John's house to talk about some things. She took the kids with her. One of the kids remembers seeing them in the driveway and they were talking. Anne was in the driver's seat of her car and John was standing next to the car. He said he doesn't remember them arguing at all. Um, And this is their son, Glenn. Later that evening, John told the children that their mom was going to take a vacation so she could think about things. He said he thought it was odd that she never said goodbye. Now, mind you, at this time, the kids are like 7, 11, and 14. Yeah, I was going to say, how so, old are you? Yeah, so, so Glenn is the oldest? <clears throat> no, Joanne is the oldest. Glenn is the middle. And then the Caitlin is the, the youngest. So the middle it's was girl, what boy, age? girl. 11. 11. Oh, so so he was thinking, it's weird that mom didn't say goodbye didn't to say me. Didn't say goodbye. And yeah. then my dad's just telling me, like, she's going to take a vacation. Yeah. So all they were told was that their mom went on vacation And she never returned. After a week passed, the oldest sister, Joanne, started calling around to some of her relatives and some of her mom's friends to see if anybody had heard from her. Anne's niece was aware of her plan to leave John, but she said she would never have left her children. Yeah. So I think that she probably had confided in some people at church, some of her friends, and obviously some family members that they were having problems. And if she had been planning this for a year, then obviously the problems had been for a while. Yeah. You know. Children. After 10 days had passed and no word from Anne, her sister Amy filed a missing persons report. After speaking with John, Amy became very suspicious. She said that John would only give her small amounts of information at a time. So when John would talk to Anne's sister Amy, she he would say just like little like he would give her just like a little bit of information and then a couple days would pass and then he'd give her another little bit of information but nothing was ever given like this is what happened or this is that like he would just kind of tiptoe around things and never give her like the full information of any story about what happened so she started to become very suspicious of that which i think anybody would so amy and her daughter Anne's niece knew that Anne wasn't happy in her marriage. She was always complaining that he was very tight with money and was very controlling. 
Anne had told her friend Deanne that she had been considering divorce for at least three years, but John wasn't having it. Image was everything to him. He believed it was better to put on a show for everyone so people thought things were fine than get a divorce. So he was all about what things looked like. Yeah. As long as everybody on the outside thinks that we're good. Then we then, must be good. Then we must be good, right? Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I think... I feel like maybe the controlling part was more of what led to the divorce than him being tight with money. Cause yeah. you know, well, it's hard too when you're a stay at home money mom and you have no control and then somebody yes. is sitting there trying to control, control you, you and tell you what to do yeah. and what not to do. Yeah. It's hard. So when Deanne got word that Anne was missing, she said that her first thought that popped into her head was that her husband had killed her, that John killed her. Three weeks later, there was still no sign of Anne. They appointed two detectives to work on the case, one of them being Frank Salerno. So Frank Salerno is um, a very... He sounds familiar. He, so he worked the Hillside Strangler case. Yeah, okay. And he also worked the Night Stalker case with Gil Creo. Yeah, I knew that name sounded familiar. Who we have had on this podcast. So if you haven't watched that episode, we interviewed uh, Gil Creo about the Night Stalker. So It's very interesting. Yeah, so go back and check that out. Um, so Frank, Frank Salerno was like Gil Carrillo's, you know, hand man. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't know until obviously reading this story that he was one of the detectives that was assigned to this Uh, case. So, yeah. Um, so John's story that he told the detectives was the same that he told his family and friends. His story basically said the same, stayed the same. He and Anne were going through a divorce and she took a vacation to get away and think about things. That was it. He then told him that he met Anne two times since her disappearance on April 22nd to give her money. So So she's not on vacation. So since her disappearance, he said, I've seen her two times. So that sounds a little suspicious. And that he's giving her money. And he's he's giving her money. Yeah, he should have just kept it as he hasn't seen her. He might have been a sheriff, buddy, but not a smart one. (laughs) Thank you. So he also said that she told him that she was going to leave her car in an airport shuttle parking lot uh, by LAX called the Flyaway. I've parked there. And that she would fly out of LAX to wherever she was going to vacation to. So the only thing that she didn't tell him is where she was going. She, he's, he claimed like she just said she was going to vacation. But if she has no money of her own. Well, he I mean, gave her money. Yeah. and But I'm thinking like. Doesn't she have, like, if she really was doing this, like credit exactly. cards, things at all? Yeah. 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 So he's claiming, you know, he saw her twice and um, that now she's on her way to who knows where. Yeah. So every time the two detectives spoke to John, their suspicion grew even stronger. Being an ex-deputy sheriff, John knew exactly what to say. So during the interviews when they, when Frank and his partner would interview him, They both said, like, he's saying the right things because he knows what to say. He knows what not to say because he's been on the other side of this, too. Exactly. So he knows what he's doing. So, I mean, part of me agrees with that, but part of me doesn't. Because part of this is just kind of very obvious. Like, yeah, mm, this story doesn't. Well, he knows, too, that it's really hard to convict on circumstantial evidence. So as long as they can't find the body and they don't have anything. So he's just banking on that. You're good. Like, yeah, I'm just going to keep my story straight. Yes. As long as I don't change it around too much, they can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So after they interviewed John a few times, there was no doubt in both of their minds that John was responsible for Anne's disappearance. And they also were starting to think that, like, he had murdered her. Yeah. So all of Anne's friends and family said that Anne would never leave her kids and would never travel alone. She was very organized and precise when making decisions. Everything she did was always very well planned out and thought out. So she was known for being like very meticulous about things. Everything was planned out like way ahead of time. They said that when she would travel before she would leave, she would already address stuff that she wanted to send out to her, her family while she was gone. She would like pre do. Yeah. Like she was her house, everything, like everything was always in order. Um, nothing was ever left out. And, um, but almost everybody said there's no way that she would have left her children. There's just absolutely no way. So the detectives found calendars and notes that she had taken that were almost like a complete roadmap of her life. They found, um, like, 
like post-it notes. They found diaries. They found calendars, like everything that she had written out. Like she basically took notes of her whole entire life. That was just how she worked. That was, that was how she was. So while looking through her things, they found a letter that had arrived after she disappeared. This letter was from a guy named Bob. Bob was an old high school friend of Anne's and they had been writing to each other for over a year, sometimes every day. Then in April of 1991, Anne's letters stopped. The two detectives started to look into different things, one of them being that John said he met up with Anne twice after after her disappearance. Both times they met at a restaurant is what he's claiming different restaurants but both times that he they met at restaurants and he gave her money when detectives went to these restaurants to question the servers none of them remembered seeing either one of them john also told them that he had moved ann's car into the shade at the flyaway at this place where he had where she parked her car um and then when they had gone to go see there was literally no shaded areas at the flyaway. at the flyaway so Things are, you know. Not adding up. Not really adding up. He told them that Anne parked her car there on Thursday. So if her flight didn't leave until Thursday, where did she sleep for those three nights? From Monday to Thursday. Where was she at? So the detectives decided that they were going to go to her condo that she had signed a lease for for six months. And um, they found a bag of groceries on the counter that had been purchased on Monday, April 22nd. And had been completely untouched. And they also found a pizza sitting out on the table. And that definitely was not her. That yeah. wasn't something she would do. She would never leave food out on the counter. She would never have gone grocery shopping. I'm sure most of us wouldn't go grocery shopping and leave it out on the counter shows, for three days. Yeah, it shows that she didn't do anything from exactly. the time she from, saw him on Monday. Yes. So with all of these things, there was enough circumstantial evidence to implicate John in the, fir- in the disappearance of his wife. Detectives also believed... That he had murdered her. The detectives now had to find Anne's body. Um, I just want to say that to this day, her body has not ever been found. What did he... The kids were all inside the house. Like, I'm really curious. Like, the kids are all inside the house. Three of them. Yeah. They saw their dad talking to their mom. When did he have time um, well, let me, let me go Let's, on because yeah. there's, um, I, I don't know. I don't know what he did with her body. Um, he had to have helped help somebody coming. I, yeah, I, I just, don't, yeah, I don't know. Okay. So years passed with no sign of, no signs of Anne. The oldest daughter, Joanne had thoughts of what her father might have done with her mom while the youngest sibling, Caitlin embraced her father's story as the truth. So all of these kids, um, their son Glenn, he lived with John and he was very close to his father. So it's kind of like all three of the kids were kind of on on a different, you know, they had different thoughts about yeah. it. The oldest one was pretty much very much convinced that he did it or had something to do with it. She was older. The she middle was, one, yeah. Glenn, was kind of teetering, I think. And then the youngest one was like, he did it. So, which I'm sure put a big strain on their relationship yeah you know as children so um one time glenn asked john if he had anything to do with his mom's disappearance john got very sad and he said no i had nothing to do with it so glenn never asked him again he said um i listened to an interview with him and when he's talking about it he said i only asked him the one time and he kind of like just put his head down like he was very very sad and got kind of emotional and just said, no, I have nothing to do with it. And so he said, okay. And I, he's like, I just never, I never, never asked him again. So this is in 1991. So now fast forward to 1993 and Frank Salerno, the detective on the case is, has retired. So the other detective on the case, he continued to work, work on the case, piling up evidence against John. In 2001, he retired So now both detectives that were on the case, they're done. He retired. Um, He said even though he was retired, that this was one case that always stayed in the back of his mind. And I'm sure, like, being a detective, especially, like, unsolved cases, like, how do you not continue to think about them when that's your work day all day long? 
So Anne's sister, Amy, called the police department almost daily. And finally, in 2005, the case got reassigned. So that probably, that took four years. Could you imagine? Calling oh, more than four. In 2005 from 1991? That's 14. No, no, no. Oh. From 2001 when oh, the other detective to retired. Okay. retired. I'm like, from 1990, that's a long time. No, because Frank Salerno and his partner were, were working. working on it. And then when they both retired, then, you know. She was like, so what now? Like, it's just a cold case and that's yeah. it. <laughs> so it was reassigned to a detective, D. Scott, who had worked 15 years in homicide. However, this was her first cold case. Um, so this new detective, she inherited a five drawer file cabinet full of notes on the case. Knowing what I know about Frank Salerno, and I'm sure his his partner was very good. Just as thorough. I can't even imagine the amount of evidence that that they had yeah so it took her almost eight months to go through everything by this time in 2006 Anne had been missing for 15 years wow so detective scott put her case together and presented it to a jury and john race was indicted glenn john and Anne's son by now was married and had moved out of his dad's house when he got word of his father's indictment it was almost too much for him to handle the oldest sibling, Joanne, was convinced John was guilty, while the youngest, Caitlin, believed in his innocence. The prosecution went in strong, saying people don't go on 16-year vacations. I mean, right out of the gate. Like, yeah. come on. You just go. I mean, I'm sure everybody would like to go on vacation for 16 years, but come on, people. Yeah. And like, with let's no be real. trace at all. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm just going <laughs> to go vacation for a few years. <laughs> so even though there were no body and no physical proof that a murder had even occurred, they felt the jury would find him guilty. The defense stated that during the last 16 years, John had always been there, their number one suspect, but he never moved away or ran away. So he never tried to get out, you know, like most people pack up and move or whatever. Yeah. He was a good father to his, you know, to his kids, and he just did what he had to do. Um, he stayed in town, was a model father, and raised his children. The prosecution had 42 witnesses that they called during the trial. One of their neighbors testified that he saw John and Ann in the driveway on April 22nd, and Ann told him that she was going to get the kids something to eat. She said she was going to McDonald's. The neighbor saw her leave, but never saw her return. The neighbor said that he saw John follow Ann after, after she left. So... Obviously, like, I mean, I'm sure that's when something happened. Yeah. I would imagine. But where? I don't know. Yeah. Um, the neighbor said that John, oh, no, 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 that he saw John. Okay. The defense asked, how is it possible that John followed Anne, killed her, buried her somewhere, and there were no witnesses? And they also said that during their marriage, John had never been violent. Can I just say two things to that? <clears throat> One, Valencia, there's some mountains and hills over there. Yes, it is very he, hilly over yeah, there. Yeah, it depending on what street they're taking, maybe he ran her off the side of the road and then yeah. she's you know, that's easy like wilderness, who yeah, knows? Who knows? But that's just my guess. Second though, how do you know he'd never been violent during their marriage? Yeah, you don't sometimes you don't. You don't know what happens behind closed doors. I get doors. it, you're their neighbor, but yeah. You know, you don't you don't know everything that goes on. Yeah. Um but I feel like in, I don't feel, I feel like this was planned out. Like, I don't think that this was something that just spontaneously happened. Yeah. I, that's why I think, I think he might've had help. I, I mean, you know, know yeah, yeah, you never, you never know. So then Anne's secret came out. Anne had been seeing someone for years, a man named Bob Russell, who we heard about a little, a few minutes ago, the letter that she, her little pen pal. Yeah. So the prosecution had Bob testify. Bob read the letter that she had written to him on the day she disappeared. In the letter, she says that she is exclusively his and she would never have sex with John again. Joanne testified, who's their daughter, that she knew her mother was going to leave her father a year before it happened. Anne told Joanne not to say anything for fear that John would do something. Now, I don't know what that means. Like, do something like what? That's why I'm thinking, like, how can you say that he wasn't violent? If my husband's, like, my, 
I would never think if I left my husband, I don't, my first thought is not my husband's going to do something to me. Exactly. He's not going to kill me. He's not going to kill me. Like I wouldn't have that thought in my head, but somebody who's being abused would would. have that. Mm -hmm. So to say that she wasn't abused, she had to. Something had to have. I mean, some abuse in the relationship for For her her to to have that scare. Yeah. Yeah. So she testified on the day and disappeared that she and her siblings waited a very long time for their mom to return with food for them from McDonald's, but she never did. Instead, hours later, her father came home with French fries that were ice cold. Joanne testified that she didn't believe her mother would ever leave her and her siblings. She also said that she heard her dad call her mom a whore and a bitch abuse yeah i mean so if you're getting into the name calling i'm sorry like yeah. i get it people fight in their own but that's yeah that you gotta draw the line like that's just that's, that's yeah. not okay it's just it's not so when glenn took the stand it was clear that he had sided with his father when asked if he felt that he and his siblings were the center of their mother's life he replied no He also stated that he thought it was a possibility that his mom might still be alive. Just days before the trial, Glenn had read all of the letters that Anne and her boyfriend Bob had exchanged. He said that those letters made him think that maybe his dad wasn't guilty. There were 109 letters in total, and they were very explicit. So I'm sure that that swayed him (laughs) after reading 109 letters of your mom and her boyfriend her side piece you know i'm sure that yeah, might thank you like <clears throat> what kid wants that to would, read exactly that would what about the parent? yeah whether you're an adult or you know nobody yeah. wants to hear that so john's lawyer was the one who thought that glenn should read them before the trial he said that the letters made him feel like his mom put her boyfriend bob before her children when asked if he thought that his father killed his mother he replied no Caitlin, the youngest, had very few memories of her mother. It was very evident that she didn't think her dad played a part in her mother's murder or disappearance. It then came, it then came out that John had given Caitlin money to come to court. So he was paying her to show like up. basically to quit. She quit, had to quit her job and he gave her money to come testify in court. So kind of sounds like she has been paid off yeah. to me. Um, And then it came out later that she had also read the letters between Bob and Anne. So I'm sure that swayed her too. She was asked if she thought that her mother had abandoned her and her siblings. She replied that she really didn't know. She was too little. Yeah, you don't, I mean, who can remember that? So the jury did find John Race guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 25 years to life. Glenn went to visit his father in jail and told him that he had a change of heart and he now believes that he was guilty. I wonder if his dad said anything to him when he went to go visit him in jail for him to have a change of heart. I don't know. Or maybe after going through everything and yeah, I mean, seeing everything yeah, with who, more of a not so I read the letters, you know, four days before and now I'm testifying in court, you know. So, yeah, I mean, the thing that got me is, you know, so many times that we've talked about on a bunch of these stories is it's very, very hard to get a conviction with no body. Yeah. And no evidence. Like you don't have anything. Like they said, like there's no evidence that there was even a murder that took place. Like there's no blood, there's no fingerprints, there's no nothing. Yeah. Literally nothing. Um, but obviously got first degree murder because it's premeditated, which, you know, yeah, but first degree did, murder is very yeah. hard. And but how did they get first degree murder? Like I am kind of, I, I think he's guilty. I mean, because just based off you know, circumstantial. But yeah. the thing is, if I was a juror though, would I have doubt though? Because f- first degree murder, like he planned it. How do we know he planned it? How do you know it wasn't like a moment of a passion? Moment. Yeah, where they where they got or into a fight. fight. I yeah. mean, when he followed her or whatever you don't know that you don't know what happened yeah. after he that's left. the thing that really stuck out to me is that they got him for first degree murder yeah because that's very hard to get even mm. when you have a body yeah i'm surprised so so <laughs> just here she goes kicking <laughs> shit again <laughs> sorry yeah that's crazy um, yeah so i thought that was a wild story i 
want to keep my eye on this. Like, I don't want it to like go away just because he's convicted. The, you really need, she deserves to be found. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, for sure. Um, I will put up right here. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, I will put up her, uh, description, you know, everything, um, numbers and all of that, but it's, do they have the vehicle that she was last seen in? Mm-hmm. Did they ever find the vehicle? Yeah. Cause he said that it was parked. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he moved her car because I was thinking the whole time, Oh, the car's parked at the friend's house, but no, it wasn't cause she went no. to his house. So he had her vehicle mm-hmm. and he moved it to, was it parked in the flyaway, but mm-hmm. it wasn't parked there. Cause mm-hmm. it wasn't, he said it was parked in the shade. But they found that there's no shaded area. No Did shade they even there. find the car? Well, I mean, it's only going to be shaded at certain areas, certain yeah. times of the day. But when they went, there was no area that would have been shaded. And yeah. he's claiming, I'm sure that that's why he said like, oh, she told me to move the car because then obviously he knew when they found the car, he was going to, his fingerprints were going to be, be in, in it. Oh, you know, so yeah, he was, he was, he was, he okay. was saying the right things, you know? Okay. Um, But. Yeah, I just I I just found it really interesting that um you know and and it sucks too because when you get you know the kids were so young and that it affected them all kind of in a different way. And I'm sure it affects their relationship with each other. Of course. Yeah. So Absolutely, so especially with them not agreeing on certain things and Yeah. Yeah, that's got to be a rough one. So. Aww. Yeah, so thank you for joining us for yes, another week. Thank you. And um, yeah, we're on all social media at 50 States of Madness. We're on Patreon. We're Instagram, on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, TikTok everything, you name it. Yeah. Um, and we will catch you guys all next week. Yes. See you soon. Bye. Bye.